Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Recording? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is David Hopin, whose novel, The Orchard, was published yesterday. And hopefully, I'll get this published today. David is a student at Yale Law School. He was raised in Hollywood, Florida. He earned his master's from Oxford, graduated from Yale. Um, as I said, where he's going to law school now, first semester. Uh, the Orchard is pretty obviously his first novel. So <clears throat> tragedy is a noble word, I think. It associates us with Oedipus, Hamlet, Othello. I don't know, Death of a Salesman, Lord of the Flies. We'll talk about Flowers for Algernon and so many others. But what is it? It's, it's what The Orchard is about. The character studies in the book and the events that kind of slyly link together uh, lead us from a kind of prosaic series of situations to a series of increasingly deafening explosions and a climax that I can't even begin to intimate because of spoilers, so I won't. So welcome, David, and thanks for joining us today. Hi, Sam, thanks for having me. It's a thrill. So I've been practicing law for 40 years, and if you had come to me before you entered, I would have said, don't go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it seems like a lot of people say that. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, when I went in, I thought, okay, this is a profession. And then I came out, and I realized I'm a mechanic, and I was, Kind of, again, kind of like your book. It's, yeah, it's not, you know, it's, I'm an old guy, so I'm going, oh, it's not like you used to be, you kids, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, it's, I just kind of joking around. What are you going to be trying? Are you know what you're going to be specializing in or? Uh, I don't yet know. I mean, so I'm in my first semester, um, still getting my, my sense of the terrain and lay of the land. Um, at the moment, interested, broadly speaking, in appellate litigation. Um, but yeah, still still figuring things out. Yeah, so appellate litigation again jibes nicely with the book because it's much more erudite than actually <laughs> practicing in a, a courtroom or doing real estate documents every day. So I can understand that, um, and I love doing that myself as well. And that was in Florida. That was in um, I argued before the first DCA and the Supreme Court in Florida. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So all right. So the book. What is tragedy to you? Is it majestic? Um, great way to start. Tragedy does have majestic elements. I think tragedy, as you intimated, even when it involves um, sometimes or usually devastating events, it has a way of conjuring up bigger questions and it has a way of um, giving scale to certain things that oftentimes in the modern world feel more prosaic. Um, and so tragedy, I think in my book, was a vehicle to launch a reader into a stratosphere of thinking uh, seriously about a lot of the, um, at certain times, more academic um, discussions that go on. And so I think throughout the novel, you see that uh, is lent to a lot of the topics that consume this the characters of the book um, and tragedy. Yeah, on that note, I would say tragedy is just a way of giving certain grandeur to things because even when uh, even when things are difficult and sad, um, a lot of times, it, especially in literature, it has a funny way of shedding um, a certain nobility on characters. Uh, and it also, I think it's interesting because characters who become maybe too aware of that might find themselves orienting their lives in pursuit of gaining access to that nobility. And oftentimes uh, that's perhaps not the most prudent way or, or meaningful way to live in the end. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, a catenary that fails like in Winter's Tale where you, you're shooting for this incredible trajectory and you do a wonderful job of it, but it doesn't quite make it. And then when it falls, it falls majestically because the lofty goal was almost reached and you did everything you could to reach it and then somehow it fails. 
and maybe it's better to live a life like that than to live a prosaic life just as an as a bookkeeper right <laughs> so let's talk about okay the book is called the orchard the cover is great i own an independent bookstore so i can tell you as many people say you can't judge a book by its cover every single person who comes into my bookstore judges every book by its cover so <laughs> A good one and it's a good i assume that the publisher picked it not you but maybe you did um we had yeah a wonderful um designer uh elizabeth yaffe and um they were very kind and gave me input and um but i really i felt the cover right away it's it was, it's just i find it very striking and i've appreciated how it's resonated with readers so far hey do you have it in front of you so you can hold it up or no I do indeed. It's buried under my uh, legal textbooks. So let me just move the little procedure out of the way. Um, here's the orchard. Yeah, it's a great cover because it's it elicits the burning bush. It elicits so many other things, and um, yeah, it really. Well, yeah. If you and if you open it too, I'm always interested in covers, and I'm interested in epigraphs. So you don't have. If you want, why don't you go ahead and read the epigraph, because that gives us such a good. Idea. And you must have taken a long time to. I think too. you want you want the two epigraphs you want the prologue no i want the uh the orchard epigraph the yeah the epigraph. yeah so this is this is the first of two epigraphs that totally set um set us up in the book into the orchard um hagiga our rabbis have taught Four entered into the orchard. They were Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Aher, and Rabbi Akiba. Ben Azai gazed and died. Of him it is written, Precious in the eyes of Hashem is the death of his pious ones. Ben Zoma gazed and went insane. Of him it is written, Have you found honey? Eat your share, lest you become full and vomited up. Aher became an apostate. Rabbi Akiba entered and exited in peace. It's interesting because I went to Camp Akiba in the book. <laughs> there was Camp Akiba, Camp Canadensis. Um, yeah, so that immediately struck home with me. And I right. never, never thought about it that way before because I didn't know. Um, so the orchard represents this place that you go that could be the most divine place in the world. Um, if you approach it in a certain way, or it could be like hell. Um, I don't know, it's interesting too with um, Aher, who became an apostate, in other, in other ways it's, taught, it's like cutting grain. But I never understood the, um, the analogy between the two. I don't I, get it. I think, I think um, right, so there's some secondary literature and discussion about what does that mean to become Ahir translates in English to the other one? What happened to him? And uh, I think the I think the cutting down image is there. There is some discussion of um, the fact that he became someone who would I think storm into um, the study halls and find these years and um, turn them. Um, and that I think that would be the the cutting down illusion. Um, and so basically, these four rabbis apparently. Um, are are the four holiest, greatest um, of their era, um, which lends a certain um, a certain magnitude not only to the fact that they go about looking for the orchard, whatever that means, but also the fact that they each had such uh, radically different experiences, and the fact that they could each lead irreversibly change, given their stature. I think um, is part of what originally struck me about. Them. The anecdote. Well, as I said, it's the cover, it's the epigraph, and it basically, without again, without giving away spoilers, it, it's it's something that is involved at the very end of the book, and it it's you know normally, like I said, I, I'm sure you thought about this epigraph. Well, which came first? Was the epigraph something that gave rise to the book, or after? What well, had to be? Well, yeah, they so. I started writing this when I was a senior in high school, so I must have been 17, 18 years old. Um, and I, I suppose I had several strands of 
thoughts that were interesting to me at the time, and I was looking to combine them all. Um, I was always struck by this legend in the Talmud. Um, it was, I thought it was bewildering. I thought it was important not only for how we think about what it means to be holy and what it means to distinguish between what is moral and what is good, but I think it also had interesting echoes for the secular world, what it means to build, you know, civic identity, what it means to go about and try to be a good person in society. Um, so that, that was, you know, a very eerie, haunting myth. Um, and at the same time, I was interested in exploring um, what I think is a, a very fascinating and beautiful subculture within America that doesn't get a lot of play in on the literary scene. And so here I was as a high schooler. These were two things that really stood out to me and um, they sort of merged in my mind. So I, I set out detailing parts of the book and thinking about the long-term vision of the book and that more or less has remained the same. Obviously the book has evolved in the years since I've been writing it and I went off to college and was working on it. Um, but yeah, the, so that epigraph, the story in mind for a long while now. Well, so it's funny, out of all the tragedies I mentioned in my introduction, Flowers for Algernon, when I was a kid, I don't know, 10 or 12, I read you know, the short story, then I read the novel, and then I saw the movie with Cliff Robertson, who won the Academy Award. And um, it really, I think it actually did change my life. Did you feel the same way when you first read it? How old were you? I'm trying to harken back to when I, I must have read that. That must be one of those assigned texts you read when you're going into middle school or maybe maybe right before high school. Um, I, I actually can remember the feeling. I remember the the, the physical book I was reading. It, it was maybe it was my dad's, but it was it had fallen apart. So I remember the pages were, were literally falling apart, which maybe, you know, said something about the experience of reading that kind of book. But I, I do remember feeling um, I do you remember feeling a certain weightiness when you read that book? And at a, you know, at a young age, it's, it's always interesting what kind of books give you that kind of pause. Um, it's not necessarily a book that's remained with me nowadays, but I, as you say that, I can think back to that moment when you're reading it and turning the pages and, um, maybe because, te you know, textually I, I felt that the page is disintegrating, but also because, uh, it was a moving moment when you're at a certain age and it's required reading. Yeah, and you can, you know, it's like the same time that they would give you Catcher in the Rye to read. It's that same right. coming of age kind of book. And, uh, and, and in fact, it's an epistolary type book, too. So it's much easier to access. But the point about it was, was in my mind about tragedy and Flowers for Algernon is, again, it has that arc. And like you're saying about the pages disintegrating. Right. At, at one time, the book was cogent and readable, and then eventually it's just going to fall apart. And yeah. there'll be yeah. left, which reminds me of something in the book, and then we'll get to the book itself. I do this all the time. I just kind of... I love this. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> when you talk about how... Oh, well, yeah, and I can't pronounce his name because I looked up Aria, and it's like so Ari. many... Wait, Ari. Um, but when you look it up on like uh, Emma Saying or something like that, it doesn't say <laughs> that way at all. I'm sure he gives a weird one, yeah. Yeah, so Ari is great. I should have be a lot easier. Or Drew. Um but he talks about how you stand somewhere and then you realize you're only going to be in an empty room and that's where you're going to end up. And it was a very, it's a very fatalistic kind of lonely place to imagine that your life will end up. So based on that, why don't you tell us entering into the story itself, why he felt that way and how he grew up in Brooklyn yeah, just tell a little bit about the story. That's, sure. That's, um, that's great. So as as we've already uh, mentioned, the novel in some ways transposes that myth from the Talmud about the orchard into contemporary times. Um, with that anecdote about the four rabbis in the background, the book follows the story of Ari Eden, who is this... Um, thoughtful 18 year old living in a very right wing, ultra orthodox um, Jewish community in Brooklyn and abruptly finds himself uprooted to um, 
Miami, where he uh, is, is introduced to a much more fast-paced and modernized world. Uh, he falls in with this crowd of ambitious and defiant and um, in some ways uh, dangerous group of friends who begin testing the boundaries of their faith um, in unconventional ways. Um, and so the orchard begins with Ari leaving Brooklyn when his family is moving down. Um, and that scene you referenced where he's uh, faced with the thought of leaving his old life and hasn't yet gone to Florida and started his new life, but is thinking about what it would mean. Um, and so Ari at that point is someone who in many ways lives within a literary world before he leaves Brooklyn. Uh, he is a hungry reader and he's someone who, at least while he's growing up, feels somewhat confined by the way of life um, to which he's exposed. And he seeks refuge um, Flowers for Algernon actually comes up in the book once because it's uh, Ari thinks of a lot about experience outside of his community um, through the page. He can only live vicariously at some points uh, in the beginning of the book in his old life. And so um, the novels to which he's exposed and the great texts uh, he inhabits are his way of projecting himself into the world and thinking about what it would mean to go on, reinvent himself. And when he's given that opportunity, when he moves to Florida, um, things change and he is exposed to um, a whole new culture, a whole new group of friends and a whole new way of having the, having the very important moment of self-discovery. I mean, it happens throughout, but I think there are particular moments where he sits back and realizes this is what my life is. Uh, this is what my life has been. And I now have the opportunity to redefine and to think about what is important to me and to cultivate that image. Um, so he does it through books. He does it through um, the friends he's with. He does it through classes and interesting um, teachers he has now in when he moves to Florida. But so throughout the book, it's a coming of age book. Um, that's both a story of a book of ideas and it's also very much um, a fast-paced narrative that thinks about what it means to come of age in today's world and it does so in intense fashion at times. Well, let's get Brooklyn out of the way. So we start in Brooklyn and Ari is a guy who has friends but they're not really friends. He's not really happy. He doesn't really care about leaving this place where he was born and raised. And he's got parents that create a dichotomy in themselves and then kind of in himself, at least at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So normally I hate asking questions like, is this autobiographical? But you're so young, I kind of have to ask that because otherwise I don't know where you would get the experience that would allow you to write the book. Sure, it's a fair question. Um, but I should note that it truly is a fictional work. Um, it's not autobiographical. The, the part that is autobiographical is that I did grow up in a modern Orthodox Jewish community. Um, I am a modern Orthodox practicing Jew. Uh, and so the way of life, um, the way of life that allows you to have basically what's a, a dual curriculum that that was very foundational for me in my own life and in this book uh, basically the idea that you grow up in a world in which half of your day is split uh, between very traditional elements of you know you prayer and judaic texts um, and biblical study and then you go off to the second half of the day where you pursue very rigorous secular studies and you have you know basketball practice after school and basically you're in this really fascinating subculture where you are balancing uh and modern life uh and when you grow up in these communities you do so almost without the realization that this is a unique experience um you're in somewhat of an insular world and so 
it's not until you peer out of that world and when you go off uh, where you can appreciate what a what a interesting and I think very beautiful way of life it is. Um, so for me, that that strand of the book is autobiographical in that I grew up in that kind of world. I have uh, such a profound appreciation for that world. Um, and so for me, when I started writing this as a high school student, that was the world I saw. And I and I was thinking, you know, this is this is such an interesting cultural experiment in America, and I don't see it a lot in books. And in a lot of times, especially now, you see a lot of narratives about like, leaving the fold or you know. Jewish American culture writ large, but this was a particular, um, a particular way of life that I think is worth exploring. So for me, that was that was one of the um, that was one of the first ways I felt compelled to think about the book. But in in terms of the events of the book and uh, that sense of moving, um, that's all auto. That that's all very much not autobiographical. Um, it's a fictional. Um, projection of what I think is an interesting storyline. But I mean, I will say that one of the early pieces of advice I got when I was writing um, is that world building is just world building. And so you can set your novel in, you know, uh, ultra orthodox community in Brooklyn, or you can set your novel in some kind of like interstellar world, you know, in an intergalactic faraway place. And that's great, but the setting is is important if it does more. Setting is important if it gives you a way to ground your reader and then project your reader uh, into some other, you know, into deeper discussions and questions. And so for me, it was never about um, it was never about that world only for the sake of you know exposing that world or showing that world. It was just for me, it was a very interesting way to um, kick off some very important and pressing questions okay well one last question then about your life sure were you allowed were you did you live in a community where you were allowed to wander to the books that ari reads or were you just discouraged from doing that by a father or mother some other figure or were you discouraged by the community from reaching out to modern literature no actually we were we were very much encouraged um to read and read widely um as i said this was the community I'm from is a very um, open-minded and academic and thoughtful uh, community. And so there was very much a culture of reading as much as you can get your hands on. Um, both my parents instilled that love of reading uh, and importance of reading in me from a, a very young age. Um, I was one of those kids who used to fill binders and binders of these silly, you know, epics that I would write. Um, and so for me, I, I always had a book uh, in my hand or a stack of books in my room, and uh, my parents were very influential in that. So reading was never forbidden fruit for me. Um, but it was interesting when writing art to think about what it would mean to have both a deep love and urgent need to read and have reading still occupy this sort of forbidden space. I, I, that was interesting to think about, just because that was such an alien concept to me. It's funny, I, when you said uh, intergalactic, I thought of yeah. Megatron. And uh, and did you read his Dark Materials by Philip Pullman? I have not. Yeah, because Megatron's in there and Metatron. Megatron, Metatron yeah. yeah. Metatron, um, who is the archangel, but also has this very dark side. And Dark Materials, he is um, not satanic, but he's on the wrong side. Uh -huh. So that's, you should definitely read that. And there's also... Yeah, and that's my list. Yeah, it's also on Netflix now, too, the second season, but I would read the books first. Right. So once I saw, once uh, there's there's basketball in the book. And once I saw the, the word suicides, I thought, oh, he must play basketball. So do you? I do play basketball. Um, so it is autobiographical. That, that part's autobiographical. Um, it has been a while since I played basketball, given both law school and the global pandemic. But I do miss basketball a lot. Um, Basketball is a very important part of my life. So yes, yeah, in that in that way, uh, that is autobiographical. <laughs> I caught you on that one. All right. Well, so, well, did you have a coach like that, or can you not say? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't have a coach like that. That was just a fun character. Um, but I, I did think basketball was important because, you know, I certain. I think a lot of a lot of group experiences at that age and high school age sometimes feel more important in the moment than they are looking back. 
um, basketball, sports in general can be one of those things. But they're also very important because they're a sense, they're, they're a good avenue to build relationships. Um, and it's a way where you're supposedly involved with something that's bigger than yourself. And so it was fun. It was fun to sprinkle in some of the basketball scenes, both because just a way to express some personalities and also because um, you know, it was an interesting plot device and it was an interesting way for someone who moves to a new community to feel to feel more uh, accepted within a group when you're formerly part of a group, like a basketball team. Yeah, and it still reminds me of what we were talking about at the very beginning about how did he have the time to do it? Same with you. Yeah. It's like basketball, the sessions with Bloom, school, Sophia, yeah, <laughs> the SAT teacher, reading with his father, Minion. Long days, long days in high school. But especially in those kind of high schools where you do have that dual curriculum, it's, you know, it's routine to finish your studies around six after some, almost seven o'clock at night and then go off to play your basketball game and then, you know, go home and do your hours of homework. Like that was, that's a very natural part of that lifestyle. So. Plus you had to get, go, plus you had to go out and get wasted. So no, plus, uh, plus, plus there were the, the curriculars, right? You know. <laughs> well, let's go through the characters. Um, Ari, we've, we've discussed, I still am, but you've never been, you've never been in a transition period and the community you grew up in are, and still are involved with, I didn't know there were communities like that in Florida where- Very much so. Ultra Orthodox yet a big part of the finance and lawyers and doctors and, um, but still kept kosher assiduously and wore their yarmulke and wore their, all the garments that uh, an Orthodox Jew would wear and do the same prayers and morning rituals. I didn't realize there were communities like that. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, there, there are a lot of communities like that. I mean, there are, there are ways to differentiate amongst communities. There, you know, some people would identify as ultra Orthodox or modern Orthodox or just plain Orthodox. Um, and and it runs the gamut like anything else. Um, but yeah, Florida is uh, yeah, is home to many different, um, very wonderful Jewish communities of all you know of all sorts. All right, so so if we go through, we talk about Ari. Let's talk about the other characters because they are the ones who eventually are in the orchard or in its periphery. So if we talk about Amir first, for example, because he may be the one who walks out. Um, yeah, talk about him for because he, and in many ways, he identifies with Ari, as does Evan, because he's studious and he doesn't want to step outside the boundaries that he's supposed to stay in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Amir, like many others in this group, is well, so I should say the group is a group of very ambitious and intelligent friends and they each play their own role so amir um is a super bright student uh is someone with a very well-developed sense of responsibility um and identity um amir I, I won't say who serves uh who who is you know which analog in the book in terms of the orchard because i think a lot of that is uh, you know, up for the reader to figure out for themselves. But Amir plays a very formative role in Ari's life when Ari moves to this new community. Um, Amir is uh, someone with whom Ari identifies because Amir perhaps does the most excellent job of uh, figuring out how to balance navigating both um, schoolwork, responsibility, uh, taking religion seriously, uh, finding meaning in it all. So Amir, I think, serves as a guiding force throughout the novel, um, both in the more mundane times and in more serious times, uh, as a, someone who's uh, a good example of how this community works well, someone who stands out as um, a role model in many ways. Yeah, but also equally a role model and perhaps much more of a role model. And given what happens, um, talk about Noah a little bit. Noah is um, one of my favorite characters. I mean, I really love all these characters. I think part of the experience love, of starting... You, you don't love Oliver, do you? I do love Oliver. I love them all. Part of the experience of writing 
a book uh, at the age I started writing it and developing it throughout, as I like to joke, it's it's a coming of age with which I came of age. And so characters have inhabited certain permanent real estate in my head for so long that I, you know, you fall in love with them and you think about how they would joke about things or think about things. Um, Noah is someone that I find readers uh, have really gravitated towards. Noah is Ari's next door neighbor when he moves to Florida. Uh, it's an unlikely pairing in the eyes of many people in the community and in the school. Noah is this, um, he, he's almost the equivalent of like the Adonis of uh, of this suburb. He is a phenomenal athlete. Uh, he's well-liked. He's someone who is just um, well-meaning and very influential with R because he he's really the force that brings Ari into the uh, this friend group, uh, and Noah is someone who is defensive of Ari and um, with whom Ari forms a very important bond. It's interesting how at the very beginning, and I think he might have done this purposefully, is how when Noah comes over right after they meet and he asks for help with this paper, and I thought, oh, it's going to be this, you know, it's going to be, he's taking advantage of him. Right. And it wasn't at all. And I kept and there are, there are lots of situations in the book where people are taking advantage of each other. Yeah, there are. But yeah, so you have this protagonist, Ari, but you also have these other people who, as you said, Noah is like the Adonis, but then again, and now let's move on to Evan. He's an Adonis too in a different way. He's an Adonis in a different way, whereas Noah is more of the universally well-liked, good guy who happens to be the, you know, phenom star basketball phenom. Um, Evan is this brooding genius uh, who is perhaps feared as much as he's revered in this society of friends. Um, Evan is someone who is still reeling from the loss of his mother. Um, and Evan is someone who navigates a difficult relationship with his father. Uh, this has all combined to give Evan a sense of independence and a sense of aloneness um, that catapults him into some really, uh, some really deep and difficult searches. So Evan is someone who's longing for not only for comfort, but who's someone who's longing for how to make sense of a lot of intellectually incongruent things to which he's exposed. So Evan is not just someone, Evan is the leader of the group in some ways. Uh, Evan is someone, um, when he speaks, people listen. Um, and he's not just, you know, the run of the mill, uh, you know, adolescent who's defined for the sake of being defined. Evan is actually someone who seems uh, very hard pressed to um, discover how to orient himself around a sense of revelation and awe and wonder. And whereas a lot of the students and a lot of the teenagers of this kind of world naturally just take for granted the fact that they are, as I, you know, keep talking about in a dual curriculum where they they pray and they study. Jewish text and then go on with the second half of their day. Evan is someone who is very much looking to find some kind of cohesive thread that tethers everything together. Um, and he does so in the wake of, in the wake of loss and in the wake of um, personal struggles. Uh, and so for him, his, his sense of intellectual searching and sometimes desperation uh, really sets the stage for what the group will go on to pursue. All right, so even though you love him, let's get Oliver out of the way. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think he's, Oliver is a, um, he was a very fun character to write. He is in many ways um, a bit of a, the clown of the group. Um, so, you know, he has the jester role in some sense, but he also has a very important role. Uh, Ari discovers a lot about life through Oliver and Oliver um, does have, I think, his redemptive moments. Um, I think Oliver is an integral part of the group. Uh, it was also important to me to write a friend group of five in the backdrop of this Legend of Four albums. Um, that was important to me. 
for a number of reasons. Um, and, you know, I, I'll let readers, as I said, discover for themselves who they think is whom. Um, but for me, that was that was important to have a little bit of a messier analog. Yeah, I think it was. I think it is too. Oh, did you like Davis? <laughs> Davis, yeah, you know, Davis is uh, Davis is not in this core group, but Davis is. Um, a bit, you get a, he's, he's a riot. He uh, takes himself a little too seriously. Um, he's a very bright young man who has certain ambitions, and you know, what you see is what you get sometimes with Davis. I really felt sorry for him because that what happened in the bathroom, I'm thinking, oh man, I mean, that's horrible, you know, because he's going to get, but then he never followed up on that. But yet you had plenty of things to follow up on, but I'm wondering what the <laughs> hell happened to his, his <laughs> career. Yeah, you're, the first, you're the first person of all these interviews to ask, what happened to Davis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And you know what? It's funny because I liked him. You're right. I did. I liked him in his own way too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as i said all these characters are well drawn but they're only some of the characters because you have rebecca you have sophia you have uh, so many others the school's janitor essentially you know is a well-drawn character and they all serve their purpose but with regard to sophia well that's what i'm saying you have a protagonist then you have all these other people that have are completely different but propel the story forward and you say, okay, well, he's the most important. He's the most important. But then in a lot of ways, the book pivots completely around Sophia. Yeah, I I very much agree. This is a story that features several um, crucial characters. Um, depending on the reader, they might, they might identify with or um, give more importance to different personalities here. What I found very gratifying so far is that readers have have um, been able to locate bits of themselves within different characters and not just feel as if one character consumes the rest of the narrative. Um, Sophia was one of my favorite characters to write, as I keep saying, but she truly was. Um, Sophia is this, um, Sophia is this, um, musical prodigy she is um extraordinarily bright um and throughout the book harbors certain um elements of mystique and mystery that are pursued throughout um and sophia is someone to whom ari is drawn um in many ways and she's a, one of the catalyzing forces for ari to Think seriously about what he wants his future to be now that he is you know, at this precipice of. I think I just turned my Siri on. That is at the precipice of uh, adulthood. Sophia is someone who, both, um, both frightens him and and inspires him. Um, Sophia has this hold over characters because she is uh, intellectually complex uh, and almost of another world. Um, her, she, as I said, she is. Uh, musical prodigy she is a very gifted pianist and so even just attending her recital at, at earlier in the book ari is uh ari is drawn to the power sophia has and at least through ari's eyes and through mine as well she's absolutely beautiful and almost like a goddess and then she dresses as athena <laughs> and uh in addition to that well, you know, it's really interesting because, and I assume you must be this way too, because you couldn't write about it unless you were this way. Intellectually, they are all incredible. And I couldn't, I can't even conceive of having friends when I was in high school. I wish I did so I could talk to them that are as well read and as knowledgeable and as erudite as Sophia or Evan or Ari. And I, I'm, I don't want to go back to this, uh, who are you in all this? But you, you must, I assume you must have friends that you can have this kind of conversation with. Well, I will say I'm very fortunate to have uh, very wonderful, supportive, and uh, very bright friends. Um, so 
you know, plenty of conversations I've had over the years, just, you know, with my friends are, are formative uh, in my own perspective on the world and thinking about things. Um, but as I said, it's not autobiographical. I think, I think a lot of this is because, you know, I wrote the book at a time where I was studying a lot of the uh, great texts and these were things that were weighing heavily on me and important to me. And um, they almost felt natural to the characters and to have these form the foundational um, interests of the characters and their personalities. So um, no, I wouldn't say that, you know, I, I, I did not go to, and, you know, be part of this. I wasn't part of this um, society in high school where I was, you know, going around quoting Yates, but um, th these were, you know, these were my interests and these were things I, I think about in my academic work. Um, I still think about, um, and I should also say that part of the interesting and fun experience of writing The Orchard was that I wrote it on the side for so many years, on the side of schoolwork, um, on the side of my collegiate schoolwork and when I was in graduate school for my master's. You know, a lot of people have wondered, you know, are you more interested in writing? Or are you more interested in, in law and in some of the other um, academic areas? that I've been involved with. And so for me, there's never been a com two competing worlds. They've very much been in tandem and in concert throughout my time writing the book. Um, I think that they've enriched each other. And so I love this. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> my interest on in the book, I, I think it comes to bear very much so um, on what these characters are interested in and what they're reading and what they're thinking about and what ends up consuming them. You know, since you mentioned Yeats, it was weird, but just as I was reading the part in your book where it says, what rough beast, you know, slouching towards Bethlehem. And I saw, okay, I said, okay, I'll stop right there. And then I picked up the New York Times and there was an article about what happens after Trump. And it goes, what rough beast. Did you see that? I, I'm not sure I saw that particular one, but I, I will say that I noticed that that is a common refrain nowadays and uh, resonates, I think, with renewed purpose right now. I know, it's really strange. But it was like, it was like, minute from one minute to the next and i'm going all right this must mean something well it's very like what feelings you might have in the book too yeah and it's it's and there's one part again you know there's so many spoilers you can say so many things that are spoilers of the certain aspects of the book like how rabbi bloom connected evan and um ari um which seemed like both a betrayal and a gift mm -hmm. and I was wondering how you came about. Hmm. Well, the essay, I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> it's tough. Good. But yeah, it I, I think I know where you're going and, and okay. I can jump in and say that. So you're referring to an essay that comes up in the beginning of the book. It's the essay that Ari writes to be admitted into this um, prestigious high school in South Florida. Um, for his senior year when he moves down. Writing that excerpt from the essay was perhaps one of my absolute favorite parts of writing the book. Um, that essay, in some, expresses a condensed version of Ari's sense of longing. Uh, that sense of longing for not just to explore the world, but to, to feel as if he's involved with something beautiful and something that matters. Um, that's something that I think is, that's something that looms over him when he's in Brooklyn, when he's, you know, at throwing himself into books. And you realize you're only going to intensifies with Ari and with a lot of the characters throughout the narrative. And so that essay identifies that great strain of yearning. Um, and Rabbi Bloom notices that strain of yearning and is very much in some ways encouraging of it. Uh, and he brings Ari and Evan together because there's this sense of this sense of almost both reflexive awe and um, a sense of conducting an experiment on Rabbi Bloom's part where he realizes that there are these two great thinkers in his midst and are young and are hungry for more. Um, and without getting into anything too plot related, uh, 
this touches on the relationship between Ari and Evan, where Evan is someone who is not only just this sort of dark leader throughout, but is someone against whom Ari measures himself and against whom people are measuring Ari. Um, and part of the challenge for Ari is to figure out as he's figuring out how he wants to devise his own personality because he's given this opportunity is uh, what does it mean to have a foil or an analog and what does it mean to be compared to to greatness or to think about greatness and what extent do I want to back away from that and to what extent is it thrilling to be uh, to, to encounter someone who pushes you to think deeply about some of the bigger things you can experience in life. Yeah, and the fact that the relationship at one point, if you want to look at it as a hierarchical one, is like this, and then it's like this, and then it's like this. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating too. Hey, it's funny, you know, with Rabbi Bloom, basically it's two, and I'll keep saying everything's pivotal, but it's two essays. One essay to get some place and another essay to get some other place. Mm -hmm. that's, that's right. Um, yeah, the act of, of writing an essay proves to be of outsized importance in the book. Um, and in some ways, I think it's interesting to map the difference in Ari's thinking when he writes that first essay and when he pens the second essay. Yeah, it's like when I got my slim envelope back from Harvard Law School, knowing before I opened it what it would say. I wish I could have simply written a really good essay <laughs> and gotten in, but it's not to be. <laughs> I framed the rejection letter and hung it on my wall. It's always good to do that. So, you know, we read the epigraph, but each chapter has its own little semi epigraph as well. And that reminded me because, okay, this again, I'm thinking, you know, they're 18 years old. There's, you know, this is not, but then there's this invisible omniscience that creates these epigraphs. It's not created by the individual characters, but it does portray what's going to come in that specific arena, that sub arena. But yes, there's one part of the book and this one I got to be really careful with. When Ari gives this kind of speech after a certain kind of really bad thing happens. Right. And the speech is so erudite and has so many references to Shelley. And, and he's giving this speech to an audience that I don't think would even understand where he was going with that. Just like when Noah's, when Noah is watching Sophia and Ari begin to talk about Shakespeare, he's laughing <laughs> about it because he has no idea what they're talking about. And I thought about that one. Ari was talking, and I'm thinking, okay, there's these kids. You know, Oliver does, and Amir does, Evan does, um, Sophia does, Kayla does, um, all these people that know this stuff. But when you're doing this thing in front of this large audience, I thought, you know, maybe you're going a little too far. Maybe there aren't that many people that can get to this point. You know what I mean? I know what you mean, uh, but without going into details, I think the stakes of that speech were such that Ari, I think, naturally digs into what's important to him. And so these are, as I think is apparent throughout the book, these, these texts and these thinkers are not just people to study for required readings in certain curriculums and move on. These are things that have real world impacts uh and so this is a good example of how for ari this is i mean even throughout even when he's you know growing up as a reader these are things that are inextricable from his sense of self um it's how he views the world and how he grapples with things um both in good ways and in bad ways um and writing that speech was interesting because in a lot of ways i think it gives over a, a, a judgment of sorts, how what Ari would make of his experience uh, in his world at that, if you could freeze him at that point of time, what he would think. Um, but even his delivery, um, I think both, his delivery, I think both expresses a lot of erudite um, elegance and, you know, highbrow thinking, which is going on. 
Um, but it's also something that is sometimes almost uh, fractured. And so the relationship between those two things, I think, is uh, revealing uh, for Ari at that, that moment. And really, you know, looking back, this, this book is written um, with Ari looking back. And so there are certain moments where you, I think, a reader can hit pause and think where this reflects on her and Ari. And I think that's one of those uh, great moments in time. Isn't it funny how, like, if you're giving a speech or a talk someplace, especially if you know your topic, that if you drop your notes, you do much better than if you kept them? <laughs> I do. I do think that's true. Yeah, I know. I t I've noticed, I, well, actually, when I would do closing arguments, sometimes I would write everything down and then I would just leave it at the table. That's uh, that's good advice because on Friday I have my uh, my my first oral arguments we have to do so um, maybe I'll write things down and then abandon them or strategically drop them on the floor and then go on. You'll know I I can <laughs> can definitely predict that you would know it just as well if not better and then when you you know so you pause you know and then you think your pause is ten seconds long when it's really half a second you know right. <laughs> and uh, it work it works it, it, it's worked with me many times. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you're talking about, I forgot what my other question was, but then you brought this up. Uh, anyway, so you're, it's interesting that both characters, you know, yeah, they're, they're, everything's a spoiler. And you know how many times you've said that, you know how many times so far you've said, this is my favorite part of writing the book? You've said, like, I, I keep I, discovering I, new favorite parts, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess there's a lot of, uh, sensitive, sensitive, uh, plot devices in here, but... Yeah, well, especially, I mean, you take Evan and the transformation and what these kinds of thoughts and this type of mindset. And yes, OK, Caroline and Sophia and what happened certainly affected him from what he was. And Noah says, you know, he was like a really happy intellectual kid, never loved being with his mother, not his father, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then he changed completely. But, you know, it's like. So you can't really simplify what you write, what you wrote, because it is so intense and intellectual and spiritual that you can, I can say to myself, Evan made his own bed and they had a lie in it. You know, I could say that, but it, don't you think that's too, don't you think that's too simple? That's too simple a way to look at it. I, I would argue that's too simplistic. Um, I think a lot of the characters in this book have a funny way of generating certain strong emotions in people, uh, Evan being a prime suspect for that. But I think Evan is more complex. I think Evan is someone who grapples with very serious events in life that maybe pivot the way he thinks. And I think uh, to view Evan as someone who's one dimensionally rebellious, let's call it, um, I think would be I think would be to overlook a lot of what Evan both endures and both um, envisions for himself. I think Evan is someone who is perhaps too aspirational and is not someone who is turning his back on the faith uh, with which he's raised or the you know family or friends he has left. I think he's someone who struggles more than others to figure out a way to make things cohesive and whole. Um, it's just that he has a very intense, a very intense um, sense of what it would mean to integrate different worlds. A lot of this book, in minor ways and in large ways, is attuned to that question of how do we integrate a personality and when you dance in multiple worlds. Uh, and so for Evan, I think the stakes are perhaps highest. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's funny before, like kind of playing devil's advocate here. I remember also the other thing about oral argument is when I was in a clinic on oral argument, you know, you'd get up and you go to the lectern and then they say switch sides. We uh, I, I like doing that in class. I mean, so I should say, you know, obviously, so cold calling is, you know, law school 101 for those who don't know um, cold calling is when you, it's a Socratic method, you get put on the spot by your professor, fine. It's it's a lot of, it's very weird, but I guess kind of fun to do it over Zoom. A lot of times, you know, your classes are over Zoom in this world because you can't hide when, you know, 
all these hundreds of pairs of eyes are suddenly turned on you and you know they can see like your microphone uh, in your uh, microwave in the background of your of your dorm room over here uh you can't hide and so it's a certain sense of whatever but i also found in cold calls when they make you uh switch sides and take the other i, I, I find that fun it's i mean it's interesting it's an interesting way of writing fiction when you can project yourself into one character and then take the other side and it's obviously an interesting and a very crucial way of thinking about the law um so i would tend to agree and, well, the reason I was asking it was because I was thinking, okay, you're saying he's not simplistic. And I was suggesting, well, maybe he is. But if you think about it, there's three incidents. Um, the speedboat and then... Good luck. <laughs> the speedboat and then what happens to the school because of his actions with his... Um, what brand of lighter does he have? <laughs> Whatever it is. You got to remember. <laughs> you don't remember it's, what brand uh, it's, it it's not a brand as much as uh, yeah, uh, a family heirloom. But it is a brand. You'll have to look back and see. I'm pretty sure it is. Anyway, so yeah, so that's two. The speedboat, that one. And then the third one, those are all, I mean, geez, I mean, you should have an idea of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The question is, why is he doing it? So the simplification is here. Here's these three very dangerous things that he's doing. He knows he's doing them and his motives. I guess the reader. Yeah. Well, some people like, you know. It's, it's actually this is very interesting. My brother, for example, and other people I know, they like their books finished, you know, and then put into a box and gift wrapped and tied with a bow. Right. Other people will like exactly the opposite, so that after the book is over, the reader can continue writing the book. And I was going to say that's what this kind of this what this book is, but you know what? It's not. It is wrapped up. Mm -hmm. You're 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 thus far in the minority of people who think that way, but I, I think it's interesting. I mean, I to also play devil's advocate. I think you you could look at the book that way. I think uh, it obviously lends itself to the opposite view. Um, what I've loved about this process so far is that I wrote something for a very long time, at, you know, a young age while growing up. And for a long time, it was an intensely personal endeavor. Uh, it's a labor of love, but it's very much something, you know, you're working on when you have time on the side and it's a private thing. To see it now in the world and see people have different reactions to it. Um, books are meant to be read. That's why they're written. Uh, and so I, in some ways, I'm sharing it and giving up ownership of it. And so, um, yeah, I think it's very fair to look at it that way. I think, um, well, the thing is, is that at the very end, yeah, it's like, you, a, but, yeah. It's, like a, it's like a chess game, like your giant chessboard size. Anyway, so, <laughs> you know, this is really a difficult one. Um, you know where everybody is at the end, you know, where right. they are spatially and you know where they are in terms of their mindset and physically, and then, at the bar at the very end, you know, let's see, you're thinking about something every day, something that's shaped your life. Okay, that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And if you know how you're going to stop that process and go to some place where you think you really ought to be and you've always desired to be, that kind of does put a. I don't. I don't know where we are on the playing devil's advocate. Who's playing devil's advocate now? <laughs> I think we're both the devil at this point. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, devil's advocate is the perfect, <laughs> the perfect thing to say here. Yes, but, it is. Uh, that's, um... Yeah, so that's why I was saying it's wrapped up because you know where everyone is and you know where they're going. Right. I mean, it... I'm saying. I'm yes. saying. It's, yeah. Okay. I will, I will, I will accept that. I think, I think it's clear that there are certain things uh, that have lingered with the characters that have consumed them on a daily basis and that have impacted where they are thinking about going, what it means to do that and how seriously to take them are perhaps why some people might view the ending in one way and other people might view it in another way. Yeah. And I was thinking of Ari's kind of trip right before the end trip, mm -hmm. so to speak. Right. He makes it clear to his old friend. 
<laughs> I didn't make it easy for you. <laughs> I, did. I mean, I, I do this all the time because what happens is I read the book. I like it a lot. And then all the stuff I'm saying, nobody who listens to this is going to understand what the hell I'm talking about, but I don't really care that much. So <laughs> I don't know if it's selling books for you. We're, we're, we're trying to sell books. We're trying to sell books, correct? Well, if, if nothing else, this is a great conversation. I'm enjoying it. Um, but I, I will say readers who might be think, hearing this and thinking, you know, what exactly are they talking about? I hope that you're, I hope that you're interested in, um, it's intriguing. It's intriguing and hope you're interested in the effect that it could have that, you, you know, to, to hear two people dancing around topics and thinking what can be said because things move in a certain fast paced way. Um, and things can be a bit explosive and shocking. Um, but also as I think is clear throughout our discussions, things, uh, have a funny way of trying to remain with the reader, um, and make you think about bigger questions that are faced by, I think anyone, involved with faith, new culture, a whole new group of friends, I think in, in, in an increasingly secular world, which is where I think we are now. But I think these questions are particularly more acute nowadays in the wake of COVID and in the wake of the general American landscape. I think people are reading books differently now. I think people are having different discussions now and trying to find things that are both comforting and lasting. Uh, so that I think that is in very way, in many ways, the aspiration of the book. Um, it's a book that, yes, follows a group of young adults, um, but it's not a young adult book. It's a book that is getting at those kinds of questions. Um, so that's what I would offer you, all those who are listening in, in some stage of bewilderment. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> that, that would be a good place to end it, but since I never really stopped talking... Oh, I, I'm gonna keep going. So unless you want to, unless you want to leave, I don't care. I mean, I do care, but if you, if you're, I happen to not have asked for a few more minutes, so we're okay. All right, all right this will be the last one then. Okay, so do you know who the fa do you know who your favorite, who a reader's favorite character should be if they're good, common sense, nice people? Um, it's a great question. I. I can tell you who, no, you know what? No, I don't think so. I think that because I think it's very hard to inject that sort of normative value making. If you subscribe to certain, you know, uh, wholesome content, this is, this should be your favorite person. Yes. Kayla. Kayla. Although, you know what? Yeah. I, I mean, in many ways, I think Kayla, Kayla deserves to be mentioned because Kayla is a very, a very good person and a very um, important character that standing amongst this this group is sometimes overlooked, um, and that and that's the nature of her character to be overlooked. Um, well, if you're talking about Talmudic studies or the Torah, you would think of her as kind of a gloss, mm -hmm. you know, over the whole thing. She pretty much understands a lot of stuff that wouldn't be mentioned. In other words, otherwise, because there's the five of them sitting on the balcony when all the other groundlings literally are eating lunch in the dining hall and they're up there just smoking and drinking and whatever mm -hmm. why do they get to do that why is it that those five and ari has been adopted by them why 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 is that click allowed to do that and that happens in high school and i was way outside of that you know mm -hmm. and i look to that as something that i aspired to and i don't know whether that was right or wrong but she explains that and derides it to a certain extent. Yeah, she she explains it and also functions as a very critical um, vehicle through which Ari can reflect in the middle of encountering very much larger than life personalities. Kayla offers Ari opportunities to think about how have you changed? Why are the people in these structures of power and with social capital, why are they the ones who have it? And all these things that you might be striving for, are they worth it? Are they lasting? Are they of substance? And so Kayla is a character of substance um, and she is someone with whom Ari can identify on other levels. Ari is someone who does not hail from a great background of, of privilege or wealth or of even just social stature uh, initially. And so Kayla is someone 
that Ari can more easily uh, have those conversations with. Okay, well, I've taken up an hour, five minutes, and 45 seconds of your time where you should actually be studying. <laughs> On the other hand, this could, you, could get you optioned for Netflix. So you have to balance the two. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> Okay. All right, David. This was a pleasure. I loved your book. I can't believe you wrote it when you're this age. It really pisses me off. Um, <sighs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a great conversation. I must say, I've, I've heard your podcast previously and I'm a fan. So it's a great thrill to be on this. And this is a, a very, a very fun and interesting uh, conversation. So thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for writing it. It's good. It's really good. Thank you. Yep. See ya. Take care.